Nicolaus Copernicus, a Renaissance-era polymath who made transformative contributions to astronomy with his heliocentric theory, which positioned the sun rather than the earth at the center of the universe. Born on February 19, 1473 in Turun, Poland, Copernicus not only was an astronomer, but also a mathematician, a cleric, and jurist, who spent much of his professional life in service of the church. His groundbreaking work on the revolutions of the celestial spheres published in 1543, just before his death, challenged the geocentric model of the universe that had been widely accepted since the times of Aristotle and Ptolemy. Thus, his theories laid the foundational work for the modern understanding of the solar system and significantly influenced subsequent astronomers, including Johannes Kepler and even Galileo Galilei, helping to usher in the scientific revolution. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's great to meet you. And if you're coming back for more, it's great to have you back with me again for another video. As always, if you want to support the channel, a like and subscribe helps YouTube push it out to a broader audience. And if you want to go above and beyond, take a look at the video description. But for now, let's get nice and relaxed, and we can begin our full biography of Copernicus. Copernicus was born on February 19, 1473, in the city of Turun, located in Royal Prussia, a part of the Kingdom of Poland. He was born to German-speaking parents, with his father being a merchant from Krakow, and his mother originating from a wealthy merchant family in Turun. Nicholas was the youngest among his siblings. His brother Andreas pursued a religious career, and even managed to become an Augustinian canon at Fromburg. His sister Barbara, named after their mother, joined a convent as a Benedictine nun, and later became a prioress in Chelmno, where she passed away post-1517. His other sister, Katharina, married Barthel Gertner, a businessman and city councillor in Turun, and had five children, whom Copernicus cared for throughout his life. As for Copernicus himself, well, he never married and had no children. His personal life drew attention, particularly between 1531 and 39, due to a rather spicy relationship with Anna Schilling, a housekeeper who lived with him. This relationship was considered scandalous by the local ecclesiastical authorities, leading two bishops of Warmia to repeatedly urge him to sever ties with her, whom they referred to as his mistress. While the Copernicus family originally hailed from a village in Silesia, situated between Nisa and Prudnik. The village's name has been recorded in various forms, such as Kopernik and Kopirinik, and today's Koperniki. In the 14th century, members of the family began relocating to different Silesian cities, and eventually some moved to the Polish capital, Krakow, in 1367, and then later to Turun, around 1400. As for Copernicus's father, Mikolaj the Elder, likely the son of Jan, he was part of the Krakow branch of the family. Records first mention that Mikolaj the Elder, as a prosperous merchant dealing in copper, conducting most of his business in Danzig. He relocated from Krakow to Turun around 1458, 
during a turbulent period marked by the Thirteen Years' War. This conflict involved the Kingdom of Poland and the Prussian Confederation, an alliance of Prussian cities, gentry and clergy, against the Teutonic Order control over the region. Turun and other Hanseatic cities like Danzig sided with the Polish king, Casimir IV Jagiellon, who promised to uphold the city's extensive traditional freedoms that the Teutonic Order, well, had been a threat to. Now, Mikolaj the Elder was actively involved in the political scene of his time, aligning himself with Poland and its cities against the Teutonic Order. In 1454, he played a role in mediating negotiations between Poland's Cardinal Olentzniki and the Prussian cities concerning the repayment of war loans. The conflict concluded with the Second Peace of Thorn in 1466, where the Teutonic Order formally ceded all claims to its western province, which remained a part of the crown of the Kingdom of Poland as Royal Prussia until the partitions of Poland in 1772 and 1773. Oh, 1793. Excuse me. Nicholas's father married Barbara Watsonrode, the astronomer's mother. Sometime between 1461 and 1464, and he passed away in 1483. Now, Barbara Batzenrode, the mother of Nicholas Copernicus, hailed from a lineage of significant wealth and influence. She was the daughter of Lucas Batzenrode the Elder, a prominent Turin patrician and city councillor who had died in 1462, and Katarzyna, also known as Katarzyna Rudiger Gentel Motlibok, who passed away in 1476. The Motliboks were a distinguished Polish family, with notable historical recognition dating back to 1271. The Road family originated from near Schweidnitz, in Silesia, and settled in Turun after 1360, quickly establishing themselves as one of the city's most affluent and influential patrician families. Through strategic marriage alliances, the Watson Roads connected with other noble families of Turun, Danzig, and Elbing, and prominent Polish noble families in Prussia. Lucas Watzenrod, the Elder, during his lifetime, was a formidable opponent of the Teutonic Knights. As president of the judicial bench from 1439 to 62, he represented Turun at the 1453 Grudziad's conference that orchestrated the uprising against the Knights. Throughout the Thirteen Years' War, he supported the Prussian city's efforts against the knights both financially and in battle, actively participating in conflicts at Malborg and Lassin. He died in 1462. And if you want to know more about the Teutonic Knights, go and check the medieval playlist. I've done a video about them. Now, Barbara had two siblings being Lucas Watzenrode and Christina. Lucas, born in 1447 and dying in 1512, became Bishop of Varmia and a staunch adversary of the Teutonic Order. His influence and opposition to the Order was so profound that the Grand Master once called him the Devil Incarnate. Elected Bishop in 1489, Despite King Casimir's preference for his own son, Lucas managed to maintain his position by fostering close relationships with the subsequent Polish kings, John I Albert, Alexander Jagiellon, and Sigismund the Old, 
becoming a crucial advisor and the most powerful figure in Varmia. Christina married Tiedmund von Allen, a merchant and mayor of Turun, in 1459, and died before 1502. Now after the death of Copernicus's father around 1483, his maternal uncle, Lucas Watzenrode the Younger, assumed responsibility for his upbringing and education. Watzenrode, a significant figure in the intellectual and ecclesiastical circles of Poland, was not only a bishop, but also well-connected with the many leading humanists of the time, such as the Italian-born Filippo Buonocorsi in Krakow. There is, however, little direct documentation about Copernicus's early life and educational background. It is generally believed, however, that Watson Rode first enrolled Copernicus in St. John's School of Turun, where Watson Rode himself had previously taught. Copernicus later attended the cathedral school at Bokwalek, which was known for preparing students for further academic pursuits, particularly at the University of Krakow. By the winter semester of 1491, Copernicus, known then as Nicolas Nicolai de Theronia, began his formal education at the University of Krakow, alongside his brother Andrew. There he spent several years until around 1495, immersed in the thriving academic environment of the university's Department of Arts. This period coincided with the prominence of the Krakow Astronomical Mathematical School, which laid the groundwork for his later contributions to mathematics and astronomy. A credible tradition holds that Copernicus was a student of Albert Brudzewski, a noted philosopher and astronomer, who, though officially a professor of philosophy, also offered private lectures on astronomy. Copernicus likely engaged with his extensive commentary on George von Feuerbach's influential works. Moreover, Copernicus is believed to have attended additional astronomical lectures given by other notable students at the university, such as Bernard of Birskopi, Wokiek of Gipia, and Jan of Glogau, along with many others. This intensive educational experience and the tutelage of several of the era's most respected scholars profoundly influenced Copernicus's intellectual development. You know how they say you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Well, Copernicus had certainly surrounded himself with some very good influences, influential in his intellectual development. Now, during his four years at the University of Krakow, Copernicus received a robust education that laid the foundational groundwork for his future contributions. His studies there covered a broad range of subjects, including arithmetic, geometry, geometric optics, cosmography, and theoretical and computational astronomy. This formal education was complemented by his engagement with the philosophical and natural science works of Aristotle, such as De Coelho and Metaphysics, as well as the writings of Averroes. These studies not only fueled his interest in scientific and mathematical inquiries, but also immersed him in humanistic culture, characteristics of the Renaissance period. But Copernicus did not limit his learning to the classroom. He expanded his knowledge through avid independent reading. During his time in Krakow, he acquired and studied several significant texts, such as works by Euclid, Halley Aben Ragel, and as well as the works of Johannes Regiomontanus. This period likely marks the beginning of his earliest scientific notations, 
some of which have been preserved at Uppsala University. Additionally, he began assembling a substantial personal library, mainly focused on astronomy. Though this collection was eventually seized by the Swedes in the 1650s during the Deluge, and is now also housed at Uppsala University Library. The intellectual environment at Krakow crucially influenced Copernicus's scientific perspective, particularly his critical analysis of the prevailing astronomical systems of his time. Thus he scrutinized the logical inconsistencies found in the traditional Aristotelian model of homocentric spheres and Ptolemy's complex framework of eccentrics and epistles. This critical examination led him towards developing his revolutionary heliocentric theory, fundamentally altering the course of astronomical thought. Of course, heliocentric meaning helios as in sun, just in case you did not know which leads us to the fall of 1495. Without completing a degree, Copernicus left Krakow for the court of his uncle, Lucas Watzenrode the Younger, who had been elevated to Prince Bishop of Varmia in 1489. Watzenrode intended to secure a canonry at Varmia for Copernicus, a position vacated by the death of Jan Zanau on August the 26th, 1495. However, his instalment was delayed, possibly due to opposition from some members of the chapter who had appealed to the higher authorities in Rome. This prompted Watzenrode to send Copernicus and his brother to study canon law in Italy, aiming to advance their ecclesiastical careers and, in turn, strengthen his own influence in the Varmia chapter. By proxy, on October 20th, 1497, Copernicus formally succeeded to the Varmia canonry, granted to him two years earlier. He added a sinecure at the Collegiate Church of the Holy Cross of St. Bartholomew in Rocklaw, on January the 10th, 1503. And despite being eligible for additional ecclesiastical benefices, after receiving a papal indult in November 29th, 1508, he did not seek further positions within the chapter, and relinquished his Roclaw sinecure in 1538. It remains unclear if Copernicus was ever ordained as a priest, although he took minor orders sufficient for a chapter canonry. His potential ordination is still a matter of debate among scholars. Leaving Varmia in mid-1496, Copernicus arrived in Bologna in the fall, registering at the University of Jurists' German Nation, shortly after January the 6th, 1597. His time at Bologna, from fall 1496 to spring 1501, was spent less on his nominal study of canon law, for which he only received his doctorate after returning to Italy in 1503, and more on the humanities and astronomy, which he much preferred. He attended lectures by noted scholars, such as Filippo Beroaldo and Giovanni Garzoni, and studied under the astronomer Domenico Maria Novara da Ferrara. Copernicus's critical engagement with the works of George von Purbach and Johannes Regio Montanus, particularly their epitome of the Almagest, fueled his doubts about Ptolemy's astronomical models. This led to his significant observation of the occultation of Aldebaran by the moon on March 9th, 1497. His growing skepticism about established astronomical theories was further informed by his studies of ancient Greek and Latin texts during his subsequent stay in Padua, 
enhancing his knowledge of ancient astronomical and cosmological theories. Thus, in the jubilee year of 1500, Copernicus was in Rome, having arrived there in the spring with his brother Andrew. The primary purpose of this visit was likely an apprenticeship at the Papal Curia. Nevertheless, Copernicus continued his astronomical observations, notably observing a lunar eclipse on the night of November 5th, 1500. According to the account of Reticus, his student, Copernicus also held the informal title of Professor Mathematum, and delivered public lectures on astronomy to many students and scholars, lectures likely critiquing the mathematical solutions used in contemporary astronomy. Returning briefly to Bologna in mid-1501, Copernicus then went back to Varmia. On July 28th, he received from the chapter a two-year extension of leave to study medicine, citing the potential future benefits of his medical expertise to Bishop Lucas Watsonrond and other chapter members. In the late summer or fall of that year, he returned to Italy, likely accompanied once more by his brother Andrew and the canon Bernard Scutetti, to study at the University of Padua, a renowned centre for medical learning in particular. Apart from a short stint in Ferrara in May to June of 1503 to complete examinations and receive his doctorate in canon law, he remained in Padua until the summer of 1503. While there, he studied under several prominent professors, including Montagnana, Fra Cassaro, Zerbi, and Bendetti. During this period, he immersed himself in the medical treatises by authors like Taranta, Messue, Senensis, Cethan, and Arnold de Villanova, forming the core of what would become his substantial medical library. But astrology, an essential component of medical training at the time, was also part of his studies. However, unlike many of his contemporaries who were notable astronomers, Copernicus at this time showed no interest in practicing astrology or incorporating astrological concepts into his later work. And don't get confused between astronomy and astrology. They are two different things. Now, during his tenure at the University of Padua, Copernicus was not just a passive student focused solely on his prescribed studies. No, it marked an expansion of his intellectual pursuits. In particular, going off the track a little bit of his normal curriculum, his engagement with Hellenistic thought. He improved his knowledge of Greek, utilizing Theodorus Gaza's grammar and Johann Batipta's Crestonius's dictionary, tools that were instrumental in accessing the wealth of knowledge from Greek antiquity. His studies during this time also included the works of Bessarion and Lorenzo Valla, among many others. It was in Padua that Copernicus's revolutionary idea of a heliocentric system, where the earth moved around the sun, began to take a more definitive shape. The shift from the geocentric models prevalent at the time to a heliocentric view marked a profound evolution in his thinking, and would eventually be later known as the Copernican Revolution. After completing his education in Italy, he was conferred the degree of Doctor of Canon Law at the University of Ferrara on May 31, 1503. Shortly thereafter, he returned to Varmia, where he would continue his professional and scholarly life. Now, in addition to his studies, Copernicus was actively involved in astronomical observations during this time in Italy, 
Notably, he observed the occultation of the star Aldebaran by the moon on the 9th of March, 1497, and he also recorded observing a conjunction of Saturn and the moon on March 4th, 1500, along with a lunar eclipse in November of the same year. Well, he had returned to Varmir at the age of 30, and spent the next four decades there. But he did take occasional trips to cities such as Krakow, Torun, Gdansk, Malborg, and Königsberg. The Prince Bishopric of Varmia, where he resided, enjoyed significant autonomy, possessing its own parliamentary system and currency, akin to those in other parts of royal Prussia. From 1503 to 1510, Copernicus served as the secretary and physician to his uncle, Bishop Lucas Walzenrode. During this period, he lived in the bishop's castle at Lidsbach, where he began formulating his revolutionary heliocentric theory. His role was not confined to medical or clerical duties, and he actively participated in his uncle's political, ecclesiastical, and administrative responsibilities. From early 1504 he was involved in important diplomatic missions, attending sessions of the Royal Prussian Diet and meetings with Polish royalty, such as King Alexander Jagiellon and later King Sigismund the Old. During one of his visits to Krakow, Copernicus engaged in scholarly publication by translating a collection of letters from the Byzantine historian Simocata from Greek to Latin. It was a work that included moral, pastoral, and even amorous themes. Copernicus dedicated the translation to his uncle, acknowledging all of the support he had received. And it aligned Copernicus with the humanist movement of the day emphasizing the revival of Greek literature and culture. Additionally, he composed a Greek epigram for the wedding of Barbara Zapolia to King Zygmunt the Old in 1512, marking his entry into the realm of poetic expression. Before 1514, Copernicus composed an early version of his heliocentric theory, known through later copies as the Commentariolus. This preliminary document offered a concise description of the heliocentric model of the universe, distinct from his later comprehensive work. It outlined the fundamental principles of Earth's triple motions, but lacked the mathematical framework, and had some differences in geometric constructions compared to his later works. Thus Copernicus viewed the Commentaralios as a preliminary sketch of his broader theories, a rough draft, and thus did not intend for it to be published. He circulated only a few copies among his close associates, including several astronomers in Krakow, with whom he collaborated on observing eclipses from 1515 to 1530. Around 1511, Copernicus relocated to Fromborg, situated on the Baltic coast, in the Vistula Lagoon. By April 1512, he actively participated in the local ecclesiastical community, contributing to the election of Fabian of Losenen as the Prince Bishop of Varmia. In June of the same year, he was granted a residence known as an external curia, located just outside the defensive walls of the Cathedral Mount. By 1514 he expanded his holdings within the town by acquiring the northwestern tower within the Fromborg Fortress. Despite suffering personal losses when the Teutonic Order raided Frauenberg in January of 1520, Damaging much of the town and likely destroying many of its astronomical instruments, Copernicus continued his work. He lived in these residences until his death, 
conducting extensive observations from two locations, initially from his external curia during 1513-16, to and later from a smaller, unspecified tower from 1522 to around 1543. It was here that Copernicus used basic yet effective instruments, such as the triketrum, the quadrant, and the armillary sphere, reminiscent of the tools of ancient times, to carry out more than half of his recorded sixty astronomical observations. Settled in Fromburg, Copernicus found himself deeply involved in the politics and economic fabric of Barmia, the region then navigating the precarious waters of external threats from the Teutonic Order and internal pressures towards autonomy. His allegiance was firmly with the Polish crown, evident from his public undertakings which included defending Polish interests and advocating for monetary reforms that aligned with the crown system. His political engagement was thus marked by his participation in the Second Treaty of Piotrkow on December the 7th, 1512, which aimed at ensuring the bishopric of Varmia remained under Polish influence. Alongside political activities, Copernicus managed the chapter's economic affairs as Magister Pistorie, beginning in 1512, and later again in 1530, while also serving as Chancellor and Overseer of the Chapter's estate since 1511. Despite these substantial responsibilities, he still had time to devote himself to astronomical observations between 1512 and 1515. Studies during this period notably advanced his understanding of planetary movements, particularly Mars and Saturn, and led him to observe the variability of the Earth's orbital eccentricity and the movement of the solar apogee. Astronomical work also intersected with broader scholarly endeavors, such as the proposed reform of the Julian calendar. Around 1513, at the request of Paul of Middleburg, the Bishop of Fossombrone, Copernicus engaged with efforts to reform the calendar, contributing to discussions that would later be recognized in his major work, and in Middleburg's treatise. From 1516 to 21, Copernicus presided at Olstein Castle, overseeing the economic management of the Varmia region, including efforts to repopulate deserted fiefs to enhance economic stability. His tenure was punctuated by the Polish Teutonic War, during which he orchestrated the defense of Olstyn against the Teutonic Knights and represented Poland in peace talks. During the 1520s, he was significantly involved in advising the Royal Prussian Regional Assembly on monetary reform, a pressing issue in Prussian politics at the time. His work in this area included writing a treatise on the work in 1526, which posited what is now known as Gresham's Law, Bad Money Drives Out Good Money, well before Thomas Gresham articulated the concept. Additionally, he developed a quantity theory of money by 1517, laying foundational ideas that would later become central to modern economics. Thus, his insights into monetary theory were well regarded and influenced the currency stabilization efforts, both in Prussia and Poland. In 1533, Johann Windmannstetter, secretary to Pope Clement VII, introduced the Pope and two cardinals to Copernicus's heliocentric theory. The Pope was so impressed that he gifted Widmanstetter a valuable present. In 1535, Bernard Wapowski, 
in a letter to a Viennese gentleman, urged the publication of what he described as an almanac by Copernicus, likely referring to his tables of planetary positions. This letter is the sole historical record mentioning a Copernicus almanac, and highlights early discussion surrounding his theories. Following the death of the Prince Bishop of Varmia, Mauritius Ferber, in 1537, Copernicus was involved in the election of his successor, Johannes Dantiscus. Although his own candidacy was mainly symbolic due to Dantiscus' pre-secured position, and, of course, royal backing, which certainly helps to grease the wheels. Relations between Copernicus and Danticus initially were cordial, with Copernicus providing medical care. However, their relationship soured over suspicions related to Copernicus's housekeeper, Anna Schilling, whom Danticus eventually banished from Fromborg in the spring of 1539. In his role as a physician, Copernicus was highly respected and sought after, particularly by the high-ranking clergyman of Barmia. His medical services extended to his uncle, other church members, and later to the bishops of Barmia, including Mauritius Ferber and Johannes Dantiscus. His medical reputation was such that in 1541, Duke Albert of Prussia, who had transformed the Teutonic Order's state into a secular duchy under Polish suzerainty, specifically summoned Copernicus to Königsberg. The Duke needed his expertise to treat George von Kuhnheim, a senior advisor who was gravely ill, and beyond the help of any of the local physicians. Copernicus agreed to the request, reflecting a mutual respect between him and the Duke, despite their differing religious affiliations. After successfully treating von Gunheim, Copernicus maintained correspondence with him, providing ongoing medical advice. Now, despite the reformative waves of Protestantism sweeping through Europe, Copernicus remained a committed Catholic, which did not shield him from criticism. His heliocentric theory initially circulated privately in his Commentarialus, attracted scepticism and derision from Protestant circles before it gained any acceptance. Wilhelm Nepheus, for example, mocked Copernicus in a satirical play, portraying him as a foolish sage lost in his astronomical musings. In fact, the prominent Protestant reformer Philip Menchthon also criticized Copernicus's ideas, suggesting that such theories were frivolous, and even going so far as saying that they should be restrained by authorities. However, the scientific merit of Copernicus's works eventually transcended the religious prejudices of the times. In 1551, the Prussian tables, astronomical tables, that utilized Copernicus's heliocentric models were published by Erasmus Reinhold, with support from Duke Albert. And this publication marked a significant acceptance and utilization of Copernicus's theories in the scientific community, indicating a gradual, albeit contentious acknowledgement of his contributions to astronomy. Throughout his life, Copernicus cautiously refrained from publishing his more comprehensive work, being on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, wary of the potential backlash over its revolutionary ideas. His fears of controversy were not unfounded, given the critical reception from both religious and scientific establishments. Yet his work ultimately laid the foundational stones for modern astronomy. 
in 1533, his heliocentric theory was presented to Pope Clement and several cardinals by Johann Albrecht Wiedmannstetter through a series of lectures in Rome. The theory suggesting that the earth moved around the sun piqued the interest of the Pope and the cardinals, indicating a rather surprising openness to scientific ideas within the upper echelons of the Catholic Church at the time, who were of course famed for their acceptance of new and exciting ideas, especially scientific ones. Cardinal Nicholas von Schoenberg, impressed by rumors of Copernicus's astronomical proficiency, wrote a letter from Rome on the 1st of November, 1536, expressing admiration and a keen interest in Copernicus's new cosmological theory. The cardinal urged Copernicus to publish his work and share his findings with the scholarly community, reflecting a significant endorsement from a high church official, too. Despite such high-level interest, Copernicus still hesitated to publish his complete works, likely due to apprehension about potential criticism from both scientific and religious communities. Well, the exact nature of his concerns remains a topic of debate, but it seems pretty obvious. Some do suggest that he feared backlash due to the revolutionary implications of his theory, which contradicted the then-accepted geocentric model, which was endorsed by the Church. And it wasn't until 1539 that Copernicus's theories would begin to be formally readied for publication. This was largely prompted by the arrival of George Joachim Reticus, a mathematician from Wittenberg, who became Copernicus's pupil. Reticus was instrumental in furthering Copernicus's work, writing in the Narratio Prima, which summarized Copernicus's theory, and overseeing the initial phases of the publication of his works. Reticus arranged for the printing of Copernicus's work in Nuremberg with Johannes Petrius. However, Andreas Osiander, who took over the final phases of the printing process after Reticus had to leave, added a controversial, unsigned preface. This preface attempted to placate critics by suggesting that Copernicus's model was merely a mathematical tool for easier calculation rather than an assertion of physical reality. Osiander's preface implied that the hypothesis presented by Copernicus did not necessarily reflect the true nature of the cosmos, a move that sought to shield the work from theological criticism by simply detaching it from reality. This unauthorized preface later became a source of contention and confusion, as it was a contradiction of Copernicus's intentions of presenting a physically accurate description of the universe, not merely a computational model. Well, Copernicus passed away on May 24, 1543, at the age of 70. And according to legend, on the day of his death he was presented with the final printed pages of his seminal work. It is said that he awoke from a coma induced by a stroke, saw his completed book, and passed away peacefully, content with having seen his life's work reach its completion. He was initially buried in Frombourg Cathedral in Poland, where his grave went unmarked for centuries, leading to speculation and extensive searches for his remains. Various attempts to locate his burial site in the cathedral throughout the 19th and 20th century were unsuccessful. However, in 2004, a new search began with renewed vigor based on the research of the historian Jerry Sikorsky. 
In 2005, the team located what they believed to be Copernicus's remains beneath the cathedral floor. But this discovery was only announced in 2008, after forensic analysis had been completed. Forensic experts from the Polish Police Central Forensic Laboratory contributed to the identification, reconstructing a face from the skull that matched a self-portrait of Copernicus, complete with a broken nose and a scar above the left eye. Forensic examination suggested that the skull was indeed of that of a man who died around the age of 70, consistent with Copernicus's age of death. On May 22, 2010, Copernicus's remains were reburied in Fromborg Cathedral with full honors. The new grave was marked with a black granite tombstone, highlighting his role as the founder of the heliocentric theory and his status as a church canon. The tombstone is adorned with a representation of Copernicus's model of the solar system, symbolically placing a golden sun encircled by six planets at its very center. Thank you very much for listening to our biography of Nicholas Copernicus. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Well, I'd like to thank my top-tier patrons, James, Tim, Wendy, Jeffrey, JC, Stark Factory, Charles, and Britt. If you'd like to support the channel, well, you know what to do. You'll find the links. But until next time, thank you once again for listening. It's been a pleasure. And I will see you in the next exciting episode. Good night, everybody. Take care of yourselves.